I've been looking forward to this day. You know, I, I count it a great honor to have our speaker with us today. And just let me say something. God has a unique way of putting people in proper position for the proper time. I remember when Mordecai told Esther, you have arrived at the kingdom for such a time as this. And I was thinking about how God promoted certain individuals throughout scripture to places of influence like Joseph. He got there just in time, right? And then I was thinking about Nehemiah, how that Nehemiah was the governor of the city. And his responsibility was to build walls and reestablish gates. Because he had heard the walls were broken down and the gates were burned with fire, which meant, meant the city had no defense. And as a governor, he was able to rebuild walls and reset gates. How many of you know those gates are your praise? We'll talk about that another time. But the gentleman I'm about to introduce to you, I heard him speak one time. We were doing something here for something. And he got up and spoke for about 10 minutes. And I looked at Pastor D. I said, this man got to come back over here and just open the Bible and preach. Because he's just too good. And uh, let me tell you, I believe God's going to give you a prophetic word that is going to launch you out of your historical past and into your prophetic future. How many of you are ready to leave the place you've been and get to the place God ordained you to be? Clap your hands and welcome Nicholas Nico LaHood, the District Attorney of San Antonio. Thank you, love you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Wow. I love this church. Do you realize how important it is to praise the Lord? I mean, I'm going to talk about faith here in a little while and... and and the pastor, well, he said I can just speak and be myself. That's what he told me. I'm not politically correct. I'm Jesus correct. That's what I mean. I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> but I'll right back at you. <laughs> but let me tell you this. Praise is like spiritual repellent, right? What does the word of God say? That Lord, the Lord inhabits the what? Praises of his people. So it's important to open up worship with praise and worship. It shows exactly where your faith is in. And I'm going to talk about that today. But before I do that, Romans 13 says to give honor to whom honor is due. Do you agree? And a prophet is not honored in his own house. Not that you don't appreciate your pastor, but I just want to thank him. And look at what you guys are going to do as a church. You're going to go bless other people. You're going to go so somewhere else. The word of God says it's better to give than to receive. It's better to serve than to be served. And so your pastor is reflecting this guy named Jesus we're going to talk about today. So let's honor Pastor Hawkins and thank you for letting me. There you go. Stand up. Amen. Amen. Just means strong agreement, right? The spiritual way of saying that I'm with you. So let me tell you what's on my heart. What's on my heart this weekend, it's been on my heart for a while when I talk in different settings is faith. Now, you might say, that's not original, Nico, talking about faith. But I'm going to talk about it in a different way, and I'm going to do a little lead-up before we talk about faith. Um, I have the tendency to kind of mix three sermons into one because I only have you one time. I'm going to do my best to stay on focus, but I'm going to go wherever the Holy Spirit sends me. So can you agree that it is a tough time to be a Christian today? I mean, is it not? It is a tough time. In a time of uncertainty, we need the certainty of our faith. That is a fact. I mean, we live in a time where there's moral relativism. You know what that means? Right? Where truth is relative. That we get to make up our own morality. That what's good for you, sir, is not good for me. What's right for you is not right for me. What you think is good is not what's good for me. And Jesus said, don't tell me what's good. Who are you to say I'm good, right? Only God gives us that definition. Now, society has a perception about Christianity. Would you agree? And more importantly, they have a perception about Jesus. Now, let me just say this real quick. The Westboro Baptists are not Christians, right? That's the first thing. You know those, those idiots that hold up signs and say God hates fill in the blank? Right? That's not, those aren't Christians. And just because they wear a banner of Christianity doesn't mean they have a walk of a Christian. So why? Why does society have that perception about Christianity? Why do they have a wrong perception about Jesus? Maybe it's the lawyer in me, but it drives me insane when people 
have a wrong perception about my king. I'm going to talk about that in a second and about Christianity, which is the way I live my life. I don't get to make up my own rules. It's because we've lost truth. And the church has done a bad job. The church, meaning not this church, the body of Christ has done a bad job. And I'm saying, I'm just speaking the truth in love. That's what the word of God tells me to do. Has done a bad job of properly handling the word of, of truth. And here's the kicker for me. Society has influenced the church more than the church has influenced society. That's backwards. And I'm going to talk to you about a couple reasons why and maybe what we can do about it as Christians. Now, let me tell you, there's a study, and I understand the studies can show you whatever you want them to show you, but there's a study that out of all students that go to college that claim the title of a Christian, only 13% have it at the end of four years. We're losing 87% of Christians as they go into the secular world. And the question has to be why. There's another study that says around 80% of Christians believe that Jesus might not be the only way to heaven. You have to ask the question, why? Because we have lost focus and we've mishandled truth. Truth is God's character. I'm going to talk about truth today. Winston Churchill said something. He said a lot of great things. But one of the things he said was the most important thing in the world is the truth. Now, he didn't say it. Jesus said it first in John 18, to 38. When he's talking to Pilate, he told Pilate he came to testify to the truth. And then John 8, 31 on says that if you're truly my disciple, disciple means student, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free from what? Deception, the devil, the world, yourself, whatever it is. We are called to be litigators for God. Now, I am a litigator by profession. So it is easy for me. I defend the Lord and I litigate for the Lord and Jesus all the time. My former law partner, he's honoring me today. Andrew there is my, my bro, more like my brother. And we have litigated. That, yeah, give him a round of applause. Let me tell you something real quick. That guy stood with me when everyone was after me, when my predecessor was attacking me, when everybody was, when it wasn't popular to stand near Nico LaHood. That guy did not waver. A friend is closer than a brother and I love you. Thank you, for Andrew. But you are called to be a litigator for the Lord. Whether you like it or not, I mean, no disrespect, forget about the fish on the back of your car. You're called to get into the trenches. It's okay if you have one. It's okay. It's all right. Don't worry. I'm just saying. But, but you're called to be a litigator for the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.15 says what? Do your best to show yourself approved. To who? To God. A worker. What do workers do? They work. A worker who is not embarrassed to properly handle the word of truth. Do, are you embarrassed to properly handle the word of truth? 1 Peter 3.15 says this, always, not sometimes, always, not when it's convenient, always, not when you feel like it, always, not when it's politically correct, always be prepared. To give an answer to some people, to everyone who asks, for why you have the hope in who? In Jesus, in this always and properly handling the word of truth. We are called as Christians to be litigators for the Lord. That's important now. But instead, we have become cafeteria Christians. Watch out now. We become cafeteria Christians. We get our tray, and then we, we don't want the liver. Nah, it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take the mac and cheese. I'll take the, I'll take, I don't want this. And we pick and choose about our faith that we want to follow. There's no condemnation, and I'm just trying to lovingly call to people out, whoever's watching or in here. I've been part of this myself, and especially when you're in the political circles. That's what I say. I take Jesus everywhere with me. I don't care who likes it, who doesn't like it. Because I'm about to talk about this thing called faith, which is really persuasion. Watch me. I'm going to get there in a second. Everyone loves that Jesus is their Savior. Right? And people in Houston, we want a Savior. We are in spiritual problems. We have, we're, in, we're in our spiritual mess. I'm trying not to cuss. There's kids in here. But, I mean, we're, we're, we're going through a mess in life, right? Right? Pastor, watch it. We're going through a mess. <laughs> we're going through a mess. And we love that Jesus is our Savior. But there's a second part to that. He's also our Lord. What does that mean? Have you thought about what that means? What does it mean for Jesus to be your Lord? I'm going to do interactive like I'm picking a jury. What would that means that you don't get to make it, you don't get to decide how you live your life. 
I mean, think about the old knights, right? And they say, yes, my Lord, yes, my Lord. I mean, there are people in our history that served earthly kings better than we serve a, spirit, a heavenly king. And in that time of history, a warrior for their earthly king couldn't die brave enough. Send me into the, 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 the da most dangerous battle. Give me the worst mission. They weren't like, the, we as Christians do this. We're the warriors, especially guys that think they're warriors for God. Well, we're warriors for the Lord. And then, then the God comes into a room and we're like, oh, pastor, is he looking at me? Go somewhere else. Oh, I'll get the next one, right? And then we want the next one. A instead, we should say, send me. If not me, then who? Right? And we want, we want it to be comfortable. So we're cool with Jesus being our Savior, but we're not real cool with him being our Lord. Have you thought about have you in your private time thought about what it means to be a Christian? I mean, you have to be able to properly handle the word of truth. Right? I mean, even with yourself, this will bless your own faith when you go through these storms in life. What does it mean to be a Christian? Does it mean to be a believer in Jesus? Is that a good answer? Right? We always say we're believers. Fellow believers. Well, guess what? The devil believes in Jesus. Right? He just doesn't follow him. I changed my vernacular about seven years ago. I am a passionate and unapologetic follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> follower of Jesus Christ. I believe in him too, but I've made a choice to follow him. That means something, right? So let me tell you what I hear all the time, and then I'm going to share a quote from someone that I respect tremendously, C.S. Lewis. Jesus was a great moral teacher, but God, I don't know about being God, but he was a great moral teacher. I couldn't say it better than C.S. Lewis. I'm going to say a quote. Quote. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. He's referring to Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a moral, great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil from hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at your feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great moral human teacher. He, was not he has not left that open to us. He did not intend it to be that way. End quote. C.S. Lewis. He is either a lunatic or the devil from hell, or he is who he said he was and is. Correct? Now, let's finally get to what I want to talk to you about. I wanted to give you a little bit of lead up. Context matters in my world, and in our world it does too. I want to talk to you about faith. You can't follow a man you don't have faith in. Right? You, you have faith in a doctor, you follow your doctor. You have faith in a lawyer, faith in a spouse, faith in a pastor. We're talking about faith in our king. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us the definition of faith, right? So since we're in church, let's read Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith, God bless you. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. What does that mean? That's got to mean something. If we expect this to live out in your life, and I often say to our Bible study, for some people, the only Bible they're ever going to read is to watch how you live your life, right? It's called the living word of God because it's supposed to live through you, not just stay on a page. James 1.22, now I'm going on a little rabbit trail. James 1.22 says this, don't just read the word of God, do what it says. If you just read the word of God, it's like looking in the mirror, seeing your reflection and walking away and forgetting what you look like. The Bible is calling you a dummy, right? And I said it very PG rated there. It says you're a dummy. How can you look in a mirror and see your reflection and then walk away and not remember what you look like. Do what the word of God says. Don't just, be, right, always preach the gospel. And when necessary, use words, right? That means live it out. You should live the gospel in your life. Faith to me and to our group, when we, when we study, we have a couple of Bible studies. A buddy of mine, George, and I lead a, a number of, of, of groups because we're really passionate about teaching people about this guy named Jesus. But faith to us, to me, is a destination, it's a destination that reveals your level of persuasion. Faith is truly persuasion, right? What are you persuaded by? Are you truly persuaded by the word of God? Are you truly persuaded by the life this guy Jesus lived? You see, the Bible is not a self 
self-help book. It's a self-worth book. It is telling you what your worth is to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? The Jesus' story is the great, you've heard this before, is the greatest love story in human, in human history. Christianity is not about behavior modification, right? It's about heart transformation. God is not trying to change what you do. He's trying to change what you want to do. There's a difference. He's going deeper. God, all, Jesus always goes deeper. He doesn't hang out in the symptoms. Look, I deal with symptoms for a living. Anger is a symptom. Violence is a symptom. Promiscuity is a symptom. Arrogance is a symptom. Substance abuse is a symptom. It's all a symptom. There's something deeper there that's causing that and is reflecting in the symptom. Mine was anger, and I'm going to share that with you in a little while. So Romans, this comes from Romans 12 too, right? We're talking about persuasion. We're talking about trying to change your life. Romans 12 too says what? Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean? We have a guy named King David who was such a horny toad, he committed murder to cover up adultery. Is that Bible, Pastor? It's Bible. It's not PG rated. Sorry if it offends you. Well, no, I'm not. Well, but King David, but why was he spared? Because he truly repented. King David was a man after God's own heart. That's something deeper than the symptom. That's getting to the root of it. I, there's a different talk on repentance. Repentance is so powerful, and that's for another day. But King David was a man after God's own heart. So what does it mean to have this renewed mind? That means something that's happened based on your level of persuasion. That means your, your life changes because you put on different lenses. I used to wear glasses. Pastor wears glasses. If he takes his glasses off, he sees things differently than when he puts glasses on, right? The word of God, this renewed mind, this quid pro quo, when we say, God, I give you some of, some of my life, I give you all of my life, and he gives us this renewed mind. That means we look at the world the way God looks at the world. Something has happened that we are putting on a new filter in our lives. And this applies in every aspect of our lives. Look, the word of God is true. I often give a lot of talks to kids and, and adults, and one of my core messages, and it's gonna, I'm going to share it with you today too, one of my core messages is that you will never live beyond what you believe. Let that sink in your heart and your mind percolate in you a little bit. You will never live beyond what you believe. Well, that's not me saying it. That's Proverbs 23, 7. What does that say? As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. You will never live beyond what you believe. So what is the ultimate question we have to ask ourselves? What do we believe? What are you persuaded by? What do you believe about your past? What do you believe about your future? What do you believe about poor choices? Look, the, here's, the, for me, it starts from here. Everybody starts from creation and moves up forward, right? For me, let me tell you the only thing that we have in common. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, if you're Christian, whatever denomination you're from, Pentecostal, Methodist, Lutheran, Baptist, it doesn't matter, Lu a Mormon, you could be Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic, the one thing that every human being on this earth has in common is that someday your heart's going to stop beating and your lungs are going to stop pumping. And that's not a doom and gloom. That's just reality. We're all going to be there. Someday, what do you believe happens at that point? What do you believe? Do you become worm food? That sucks. I mean, do you believe in reincarnation? There's no proof of that. Not one at all. There's nothing at all. Do you believe that God is sitting on time and can pick and choose who he wants to come in and there's 72 virgins and all this other nonsense and it's nonsense? No, we don't believe it. What do you truly believe when your heart stops pumping and your, love, your heart stops beating and your lungs stop pumping? Because that will persuade everything you do leading up to that point. If you're truly persuaded that you're going to stand before this guy named Jesus Christ, how does, not that, how does that not change your life? How does that not influence or persuade you to live life the way he said to live life, to let him be your Lord? How does that not? You can clap on that one. That's real. The world is deceptive. The devil is deceptive. The word of God says when the devil is lying, he's speaking his native tongue. And we are very good, talking about this renewed mind still, right, this faith, this persuasion. We are really good at labeling each other in this society. Watch out, right? And we're really good also at receiving these labels. You see, if you lie one time, you're called a what? Liar. If you cheat one time, you're called a 
cheater. Fill in the blank. That's it, right? But, and, and we're really good at receiving that labels. Remember, you'll never live beyond what you believe. Now, let me tell you this. These labels are not, uh, they don't avoid me. I've gone through my whole life dealing with labels. I'm going to share it with you just briefly. When I was young and very foolish, and everybody knows my testimony by now, I was arrested for selling drugs. Nothing that I'm proud of. I'm not proud of that moment. I'm not proud of that season, that time in my life. I'm very proud of the man that stands before you today, not then. And what do you think the world labeled me? That I was a what? A what? Man, you offended me. No, you didn't. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sensitive like that. No, that's right. Drug dealer, criminal, piece of bleep. You fill in the blank. I was called it all, right? There's no doubt about that. You will never live beyond what you believe. Did, for many years, I received that label. That limited me. I mean, I can't live outside of my box. That's it. Oh, drug dealers can only do this. People that go through the justice system can only do this. And our society says, succeed, turn your life around, but only so far. You can't run for DA. You can't do this. You can't be a lawyer. You can't, 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 stop, stop, stop. That's not what God tells me. I'm persuaded by what God tells me, not what you tell me, right? You will never live beyond what you believe. Well, the labels don't change. Almost to the month, two years later, August 15th, 1996 to be exact, my older brother was coming home after being out with some friends. They were coming back to the house because they met at the house to leave. And, and a young lady was following him and some other people were going to meet them there. These four individuals were carjacking women that night. And they followed the young lady that followed my brother home. They ended up shooting him in the face in my driveway during a carjacking. And myself and my parents and my younger brother, we walked out literally three minutes later. I share the testimony. There was times in my life that I couldn't say that story without salivating with anger and rage. And I want to share with you. I mean, I, I saw my mom cry the way only a mom can cry. The Lord trusts me and my wife with four children. They're on my arms. I can't have any more because I ran out of space. And I, you could not blink fast enough before I'd give my life for any one of my kids. You also couldn't blink fast enough before I would take a life for any one of my kids. But I think there's something inherently God-givenly special about a mommy's relationship with her child. And I heard my mom cry that way. I saw my pop cry for the first time because Mike Jr. was laying on his driveway. I helped them load the body after rigor mortis set in and they did the investigation on the gurney to go to the Emmy's office. And I helped my old man wash my brother's blood off my driveway. And blood doesn't come off your driveway very easily. That's real, folks. I became, just to give you context about that situation, because we become so cold to the world. We hear tragedies and we say, oh, that's terrible, you know, poor thing. But then we go back to our busy lives, right? We, 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 we we're stuck in our own circumstances and we don't, we don't have enough compassion for other people. Look, here's the reality of my circumstance at that time, in that season in my life. If, if, a, if a woman leaves, loses her husband, I'm trying to give you context, okay? What do you call a woman that loses her husband? A widow. What do you call a child that loses both of their parents? An orphan. What do you call a, a, a mommy or a parent that loses their child? There's no word, right? We don't have a word in the English language to describe something so painful. So when we tell people, I have no words for you, I don't even know what to say, we're not BSing them. It's true. I have no words. But I have two ears. I have two shoulders. I have one mouth to speak the word of God over you. I got arms to hug you, and I'm going to make time because I don't have time, but I'm going to make time for you. <clears throat> and that's what we dealt with, and that's real. And I got stuck in that circumstance. There's my second label, right? We were labeled what? Victims, right? And then we lived in that label for a while. Look, at some point, folks, I'm not talking about a month. I'm speaking from experience. I'm not talking about a year. I'm not talking about five years. At some point, a victim becomes a volunteer. At some point, right? Because you will never live beyond what you believe. So we live in that label. So I got two labels. And I became self-diagnosis. I never went to get help. I was too machismo. I became a functioning angerholic. I was a functioning angerholic. I was addicted to my anger. And the world, what do you think the world told me? The world told me, I don't blame you. I don't blame you, Nico. What does that do for me? You loaded your brother's body on the gurney. You heard your mom cry the way only a mom can cry. You washed your brother's blood off your driveway. You saw your pop cry. You felt rigor mortis on his leg when you were putting him in the gurney. I don't, what does I don't blame you do for you? Squat. Doesn't do anything for you. Nothing. You will never live beyond what you believe. 
Does that make sense? I was stuck in that. I had no answers. I tell people, and this is another talk, when I, at some point, because I wasn't praying for it and I wasn't looking for Jesus, I tripped over this guy named Jesus. My mama was praying. We were a broken family. I was, a, I was functioning in this world, but I was angry as hell. And the world said, I don't blame you, and fed into that deception. Remember, God's character is truth. And the truth is that did not define me. And if I was kingdom-minded at that time, I would have I would known at that time that I would not mourn without hope. Christians mourn. We just don't mourn without hope, right? Because we're persuaded that we're going to see our loved ones again around this guy named Jesus. Is that real? Are you you're with me? I mean, that's real. As I, after I tripped over this guy, Jesus, because I wasn't looking for him, then the lawyer in me, you know, took over. Now I wanted to study this guy, Jesus, because I grew up in a religious environment. No disrespect to my Catholic brothers and sisters. I grew up, went to Catholic school all my life, and I was told about rules, but I didn't learn the relationship. And rules without relationship breeds rebellion. It breeds it. I mean, if, if I were to just discipline my children without the love and affirmation, at some point it's like, screw you, Pop. I mean, what are you doing, man? You're always on me. You don't tell me the why at some point. Rules without relationship breeds rebellion. That's not a shot on Catholicism at all. I'm just saying for me and my walk, I was all about rules. So I knew who Jesus was. I could point him out to you. I just couldn't introduce him to you. Before I met Pastor Hawkins, if someone said, Hey, can I meet Pastor Hawkins? I say, sure. That's the guy, that handsomely devilish looking guy over there with that cool suit on and them shoes. Look at them shoes. I'd say, that's him, but go meet him yourself because I don't know the man. I can't introduce you to him. That was me. That was me at that time. And then I started realizing this guy, Jesus, this guy that walked the earth over 2,000 years, Jesus, and I studied him like a lawyer, like a scientist almost, right? I wanted evidence. If I'm going to put this faith, if I'm going to be persuaded by this guy, Jesus, then I want to know about this man. I want to study his life. And then I realized that Jesus is obsessed with lost things. He's obsessed with lost things. Just read Luke 15. Forget about what I say. Read Luke 15. He was obsessed in telling his parable about lost coins and lost sheep and a lost son. He's obsessed with lost things. And then he tells us what our daddy does, even though we go muck up our lives and go out there and end up being treated like pigs. And as long as we humble ourselves and repent, he doesn't even wait for us. He runs out to us once he sees the humility in our hearts. He runs out to us because that's our value. Are you persuaded by that? At some point in my walk, because it's a walk, it's a journey, right? It's a walk. At some point in my walk, I was persuaded by the guy that I tripped over because I studied his life. Well, I turned my, that's another talk, by the way. But, I mean, I turned my life over. And even as I was following Jesus Christ, the challenges don't stop. Our second child, Michael, third label, who I named after my brother who was murdered in my driveway, was at some point diagnosed on the spectrum of autism. That was a kick in the crotch for me. I mean, that, that was something tough for me. And I, I got to a point in my walk and in my persuasion, I don't even say faith anymore, in my persuasion to stop asking God why. That's tough, man. Because look, <laughs> this is where the rubber meets the road. Everybody's okay with God being Santa Claus, right? All right, Lord, here, I'll let you be God. Here my, here's my list. Uh, here's my conditions. Here's my timing. It didn't work that way, right? It didn't work that way. And so the third label we had is, now go raise your special needs child. Yeah, the child, the enemy's a good fighter, right? He's, we give him too much credit, but he's a good fighter. You have to acknowledge that. So he's on the shoulder saying what? Man, your brother that was murdered and the son you named after him, autism? God, man, God loves you. Man, tell him not to love you so much. You know, you, when you say rebuke, the, that's the Christian F word. You know that, right? So when you say rebuke you, <laughs> pastor, I didn't say it. I'm just telling you. Rebuke is a strong word. And you have to rebuke the enemy. Rebuke him. You speak and you speak. The, look, right? Come on. 
I'm just being honest with you. Look, the Bible's not PG rated. And, we, and when you leave this room, that's, that's an R-rated world out there. So if you're not ready for the battlefield, then you're going to get screwed up. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, what did he do? He rebuked him with God's word. It is written. It is written. It is written. And Jesus, in his humanity, he allowed himself to pour himself out. Philippians 2 says, right, 6 through 8. That he poured himself out as, as, of his divinity so we can experience what we experience. And is, in his humanity, he said it is written because he was persuaded by his daddy's word. He was pers- what I love about our king and why I follow him is he's not a hypocrite. There's a lot of hypocrites out there. He doesn't say, do as I say. He says, do as I did. He did it first. He went through every temptation we went through. I don't even know where I left off, but that's okay. So there, thank you. So, so the label of my son. Now here's what I know about God is that Romans 8, 28 is real. I'm persuaded by Romans 8, 28, that God works all things out, not some things, all things out for the good of those who love him and what? And are called by his name. That doesn't apply to everybody. That only applies to covenant kids. Romans 8, 14, children, Abba, Daddy, kids that have been adopted into God's family. But I know, I know that happens. And I've seen the blessings. Oh, it's, it's tough sometimes. I've seen the people been blessed by my wife and I being active in the autism community. I've seen the fact that I'm a better husband because I understand compassion. I've seen that I'm a better daddy because I understand unconditional love. I've seen the empathy as a prosecutor when I have the authority to do things, but doing what's right is always not what's easy. And you always have to do what's right, not what's easy. I've seen the effects that Michael and his teaching me, he just turned seven on the first. And he has taught my wife and I more in those seven years than I've learned in my 45 years of walking on this side of heaven. In my flesh, look, do I want to, I want to talk to my son worse than I want to breathe. But am I persuaded by God's word? I know for a fact I will hear my son talk on this side of heaven or in heaven. Our children are different children because they have a, a, a sibling, Michael, and they, they have the way the compassion and the protectiveness they have. I've seen God work even in my brother's murder, and I wouldn't change my brother's murder. And people freak out when I say that. What do you mean you wouldn't change your brother's murder? If I change August 15th, 1996, I change everything. You change, it's like a, an algebra. I hated algebra, but in algebra, if you change one decimal, one digit, the result is different. If you change something, you change everything. And if that means giving back my children, if that means giving back my understanding of my king, if that means giving back the persuasion I have for, for, my, for Jesus, I don't want it back. I told the Lord, tell Mike I'll see him in 40 or 50 years or whenever you say. But I don't want to change anything. I can't. There is no such thing, get ready for this one, as comfortable Christianity. That is the truth. I'm, is it in the Bible, Pastor? You know the Bible better than I do. No? Is it, there's no, matter of fact, it's the opposite. Jesus tries to talk you out of it almost. Look, John 16, I'll get there in a second. Matthew 10. That's the disclaimer portion of our Bible. I'm going to get there. John 16, for those of you that have a Bible. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Notice he doesn't say happiness. Not, not, that, not that God doesn't want us to be happy, but that's an emotion. You'll be happy in 20 minutes, and then you'll be ticked off in 30 more minutes. So you can't focus on your feelings. But peace is a condition of your spirit. Peace is a condition of your mind, will, and emotions. The peace that passes all what? Earthly understanding. Philippians 4, 6 through 8, right? That's a peace that only comes from God, not from this broken world. In this world, we're still on John 16, 33. You may have trouble, will have trouble. It's a promise. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's a kingdom-minded perspective. 2 Corinthians 4.18. 
Fix your eyes not on what is seen, but what? What is unseen, because what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Kingdom-minded perspective. Look, there's a purpose in adversity. We always say there's a purpose in your problems. I get it. And pastors always borrow from each other. So if I don't make something up, I'll tell you. I'll give someone credit. But it exposes where we put our hope in. Problems expose where we put our hope in. Because when, when, the, when, when, the, when, the, when the whatever hits the fan, where do you turn? I'm stuttering up here when I can't talk. I go on and talk. I'm, <laughs> but where do you turn? That exposes where you put your hope in. What's hope? Look, I'm a lawyer. Words have to have meaning for them to live out in your life. Hope is trusting in God when you don't have all the facts. That's hope. We don't have all the facts. But I have hope in my king. James 1, 2, this is one of my go-to passages. All the guys in my Bible study, whenever George and I preach somewhere, we always talk about this. Count it pure joy. Pure joy? When you go through trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so you will be mature and lack nothing. Where do I sign up for that? How does that convince me to be a Christian? What is the Word of God telling us that we cannot be spiritually mature without persevering? If you want your brain to be better, you have to strain your brain. If you want to be stronger, you have to strain your muscles. But spiritually, nobody's okay with straining your spirit, right? We want this comfortable Christianity that is not existent, right? Look, the reality is there are things that happen in our life that make no earthly sense. But do they make eternal sense? When you look at your own family tree, if you look at the struggles of your great-grandparents or your struggles, you're going to tell me that that's not going to be a game changer in your life or their life that does generationally changed your family? My brother's murder on August 15th, 1996 has changed the outcome of my lineage. My children and my children's children's children will be different kids and adults because of the tribulation and the trials that I persevered through. It's not easy though. Look, I'm not into giving you a bunch of scripture it doesn't apply. I'm an application guy. I'm a wartime Christian. And right? I've been through some life. And the word of God doesn't come back void and it's actually practical and it's relevant. It's not, this is not easy stuff. Sometimes our faith, our persuasion, we're going through these storms of life. We just have to choose faith. We have to choose persuasion because we're not going to feel it. Mark 5.22 is a perfect example of this When Jairus, Jairus, you've heard about him, the synagogue leader. He was persuaded by Jesus and what he was doing so much that he left his house and his daughter was dying on her bed. He was persuaded out of love for his daughter and what Jesus was doing in the time to leave her and to go seek out this guy named Jesus. And then he found him. And then he said, will you come heal my daughter? What do you think our king said? Absolutely, let's go. There was a couple of distractions on the way. Can you see Jairus saying like, lady with the blood, get out of here. I mean, I want to go to my daughter. Can you see that? I mean, you know, I'm just being real. That's real, right, Pastor? I mean, that's real. And then what happened? Then the world happened. Then the, the men from the house came to him and said, Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher? Ooh, that's the enemy. The, the enemy is the spirit of why bother? Why bother? Your situation is so bad. Your marriage is so bad. Your finances are so bad. Your life is so bad. Why bother? That's what the enemy says. But what does Jesus say? One version says, ignore them. But even in the NIV, it says, don't be afraid. How many times did Jesus tell us not to be afraid? Don't be afraid. What does he say? Do you feel like believing? He says, just believe. Choose to believe. Choose me. Don't, because let me tell you what Jairus didn't feel like it. If he said, hey, is, you, do you believe me? My daughter just died. No, I don't. He said, make a choice to believe me. And then Jesus always shows up after the choice. Oh, and what happens? We know that's true because they walked back to the house and his daughter was just sleeping. Well, the world said she was dead and Jesus is in the miracle business and rose her, said, give her a sandwich and get the hell out of here for everybody that was crying. That's what he said. Am I right? That's what he said.
The enemy is a master at distraction. You okay? Are you sure? Am I talking too tough? You all right? I love this guy right here. He's a good singer too. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Matthew 14, 22. I'm sorry, guys. I apologize ahead of time. Matthew 14, 22. We all heard about it. Peter's in the boat with the disciples. And Jesus is walking on the water. Is that a ghost? It's me. If it's you, tell me to get out of the water. Get out of the water. It's me. I told you. So, I mean, so then what does Peter do? Peter was persuaded, wait a minute, at that time. And so he gets out of the water. Do, do, do. And then, ooh, did you hear that? The wind and the wave. And then Peter was distracted from looking at Jesus. Hey, but Jesus, don't you see the wind? Oh, over here, Peter. But you don't understand, Lord. But look at this. And then he was convinced he was persuaded by his circumstances instead of his king and he sank what did jesus tell him he said Man, you fool you have oh sorry he said little faith you have little faith i thought it was fool i, I need my glasses why why did you doubt why did you doubt have i not persuaded you enough the devil is a master distractor if you're irrelevant, then he's going to put you on the shelf. If you're doing something good, and let me tell you something. Not everybody's called to be in public service. Not everybody's called to be a pastor. But you are called to be the chief reconciler in your home. That is for sure. That's where you start. We all have a ministry of reconciliation. And it starts in your home based off of truth. Are you persuaded by that? Look, here's the reality experiences are ingredients for your life. I borrowed this from another pastor. I hope I don't screw it up. Experiences are ingredients for your life. Let me give you the example he said. Does anybody just sit and watch TV and eat raw eggs? Unless you're Rocky Balboa, I get it. But nobody does that. Does anybody eat a stick of butter watching basketball? Why? It sucks, right, by itself. Does anybody get flour and just eat the flour and drink a cup of coffee? Nobody does that. But if you get just enough raw egg and just enough butter, you know where I'm going, and just enough flour, then you give it over to somebody else that knows what to do with it, a great result can come out of it. It's on the cake. Call the cake. You get just enough disappointment, just enough pain, just enough sadness, just enough embarrassment, just enough fill in the blank and turn it over. Come on. Can we do it? And turn it over. Turn it over to a chef, to someone else, to make something with your mess. And it could be something delicious. Are you persuaded by that? Are you persuaded that Jesus is in the miracle business? Are you persuaded that you're going to stand before him? As I wind up, folks, and I can talk forever. I'm really trying to tone it down. But ultimately, we have to ask ourselves is, where does our faith lie? Where does our level of persuasion lie? Are you truly persuaded by the word of God? Are you pursued? And I encourage you to study the life of Jesus Christ. He was a man that walked this earth that happened to be the Messiah. But he was a man. Nobody denies what he did. They just make excuses for what he did when they don't want to believe. That's a fact. Even the naysayers of the time said, oh, he did all that crazy stuff. That's because he's a demon. But you're still saying he healed two people? I mean, he still did this. He still rose people. I mean, he went around just touching, blessing children. He pissed everybody off. The Pharisees and then the left, everybody, because he was perfect. He stood on truth. Where everybody else landed on that spectrum of truth was on them, not on him. Do you properly handle the word of truth? Are you persuaded by God's word? Are you persuaded by John 14, 6? One of my best. I love this passage. Jesus said this. I am one of the ways. I am what? The way. Does that make you uncomfortable? It doesn't make me uncomfortable. Truth is specific. I don't care what anybody feels about gravity. You might have your feelings about gravity. But if I drop this microphone, guess what? Regardless of what you feel, it's going to hit the floor. There is ultimate truth, not relative truth. Jesus said, I am the way. That means one. I am the truth. That means there's just one. And I am the he didn't say, I'm one of the lives. I'm the life. No one. Did he say some people? No one comes to the Father except by him. That might make some people uncomfortable in today's society. But the thing is, he's the only guy that backed it up. 
He's the only one that backed it up. He claimed what he claimed. He did what he did. Then he died for it, and then he conquered the grave. And I can prove that from an objective standpoint as a litigator. It's another talk, Pastor. We're going to talk about that later. Matthew 10, 32. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge you before the Father. Ooh, this is sobering to you spiritually. It better. Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown you before the Father in heaven. If you're persuaded that you're going to stand before these folks, how does that not influence the way you live your life? How do you acknowledge Jesus before men? By acknowledging what he taught. Not watering it down. Being properly handling the word of truth. Leading with love and, and gra gratitude and respect, right? Proverbs, um, 1 Peter 3.15, don't forget 16. It's, you're supposed to gently instruct people and respectfully respect them, instruct them, but still stand on truth. Galatians 6.9, do not grow weary. Persevering, remember James 1, 2, for doing good, for at the proper time, not on your time, on God's proper time, we will reap a harvest. If we don't, what? If we don't give up, persevere, choose faith, choose Jesus, you're not always going to feel it. And then finally, Isaiah 48, 17. Can't ignore the Old Testament, guys. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. That means he knows, not you. Who directs you in the way you should go. Look, Jesus is real. There's no doubt about that. He did what he said he did. He was who he said he was. He rose from the dead. He came back. He did all the miracles. And he's alive and well. And he's in the transformation business. And he did that in your life because he did it in mine. And the one thing that I will tell you this that encouraged me, and I know this just ticks off religious people, Romans 8, Romans 10, 9 says, if you profess with your mouth, you say, you make a declaration about something, that Jesus is Lord, and believe it, be persuaded by it in your heart, that he rose, that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved, truly saved. If you haven't given your life to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to really think about that in your heart. Look, I'm not into, I'm not great about altar calls. I don't know what that means. All I know is this guy, Jesus, transformed my life. I know he's real. I'm broken. I've had the crazy life. But I know that I look at the world differently now. How does a guy who's gone through what I've gone through in my life that used to look in a room like this and look at people and say, try to get one over on me. I'll crush you because I was so broken inside. You can't give what you don't have, Right? And I didn't have any love or forgiveness to give anybody or mercy. And now you have that same guy that's crazy in love with this guy named Jesus. And because Jesus is crazy about you, I love you. It's just the way it is. I can't help it. That's transformation. That's a renewed mind. I look at the world through his lenses, not mine. And I'm persuaded by the fact and you can ask anybody. I'm the same way in private as I am in public. I don't have a public persona or a private persona. I just have a persona. I might talk a little rougher in private. But, I mean, I have a public and a, it's the same. It's all about Jesus. That's it. That's the truth. And what I know for sure, and I don't know you from Adam, these gentlemen here in the purple, but I know this guy named Jesus is crazy about you. And he sees the value in you that I don't know. And I'm crazy about him. So how do I not show love to someone or to something that who I'm crazy about loves? And that died for. He died for you and me and everybody else. Whether they want to accept it or not, he did. So if you haven't accepted Christ as your, as your Lord and you want to, it's real easy. And I'm not big on calling people up. But if you want to come up and feel moved by it, if you want to sit in your chair, all you have to do is say some simple things. Anybody, is, anybody, is anybody not giving their life to Christ? It matters, folks. Look, we are called to be salt in life. We are. That means preserve the truth. Illuminate dark situations. And that's what Jesus does masterfully. All you <laughs> Romans 10, 9, that's it. It's that simple. It's that simple. Look at it. That's that simple. On the cross, the thief said, remember me. That's all he said. See you in paradise. What? That's it? That's it. Why? Because he professed with his mouth and he believed in his heart that Jesus was Lord. And then Jesus said, see you in a little while. That's you can't check off enough boxes, folks. God does not expect perfection, just perfect effort. That's it. And when you're, man, I screwed up, and then try it again. And the time it takes to do the right thing gets shorter and shorter and shorter. The closer you walk with this guy named Jesus, it gets shorter. 
The things I used to do in the past took a while for it to register to me, and now it's immediate because my walk with Christ and my persuasion is where it's at. But life is tough. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The word of God is true. Your circumstances aren't freaking out the Lord. And if you want to give your life to him now, just raise your hand or stand up where you're at if you want to. And pastor, I don't know how you guys do it here. I'm just, it's just real simple to me. We can all say it together. Lord, thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you love me first and that you love me best. I believe that you rose from the grave. Come into my heart. I give you my life. I make a choice today to make you Lord of my life. That means you get to run my life. I commit my life to you. And I thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, thank you. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for having me here.